Almagenati Mirandasya Gyananjala Shalakaya Chakshu Unmilitam Jena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Guru Ve Gaurachandraya Radhikaya Tadalaye Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya Taravaktaya Namo Namaha Yam Prabhajanta Mana Petyam Apeti Krityam Dvaipaino Viraha Katara Ajuhava Putre Titam Mayatayo Tarobani Rustam Sarvabhutam Munimanatoshmi I first of all offer millions and millions of Dandabhat Pranams unto the lotus feet of my most beloved Gurudev Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Asto Tarasara Shishimad Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj and the same again millions and millions of times unto the lotus feet of our beloved Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Asto Tarasara Shishimad Srila Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada and all the Vaishnav and Vaishnavi devotees of the Lord Dandavat Pranams so today we've reached Tad Vimuktams Amnaya Praha Tattvam this Amnaya, the Veda Praha proclaims Tattvam, the truth Amnaya Praha Tattvam Harim Krishna, Hari Harim uh, Iha Paramam this Krishna is the supreme truth this is the first Pramaya second Sarva Shaktim that all of Krishna's energies are the second Pramaya and then Rasabdim this knowledge of Krishna's remarkable relationships with the Jiva and with his eternal parikas, this rasa tattva and then tad bibinamsams cha what is the nature of the jiva's condition in this world what is this bibinamsa this separated energy so this is bibinamsa tattva and then yesterday we did this Jivan Prakriti Kavalitam. Kavalitam means swallowed up by those jivas who are immersed in the conception that they are the, this material body and how can they enjoy the material energy. Jivan Prakriti, this inferior energy. So this we discussed at length yesterday. And now today, the third type of jiva. So in the first line, it's the praman and three prameyas. The second line, it's three prameyas about the jiva. It's very simple, really, the way Bhakti Vinotako has set it out. So this now, tad vimuktams cha bhavet. How to become liberated from this entanglement once we have succumbed to the weakness of this attraction to the material energy and we understand that now what is the process for getting ourselves out of this situation extraditing ourselves from this material entanglement that we've caught ourselves in so I just want to finish yesterday there was in the chapter 16 there was one last part that I wanted to read, which I didn't have time to read yesterday, <clears throat> on page 383, it's right at the end of the sheet, there, I just want to read this last objection that um, Brajanath has to Babaji before we go into the liberated conception. So Brajanath, he asks the question, what harm would there have been if the jiva had not been given the desire for independence. Krishna is omniscient and he gave this independence to the jiva even though he knew they would suffer on account of it. So isn't he responsible for the jiva's suffering? Beautiful question. Babaji's answering. Independence is a precious jewel 
in the absence of which inert objects are insignificant and worthless. Yesterday we were describing this table as being an inert object, has no decision making at all. If the jiva had not received independence, he would also have become as insignificant and worthless as the material objects. The jiva is an atomic spiritual entity, so he must certainly have all the qualities of spiritual objects. The only difference is that Bhagavan, who is the complete spiritual object, possesses all these qualities in full, whereas the jiva only has them to a very minute degree. This we discussed in Vivinamsa Tattva. Independence is a distinctive quality of the spiritual object and an object's inherent quality cannot be separated from the object itself. You can't take away independence, otherwise there isn't such a thing as a living entity. The entity has to make decision. Even the tree has to make a decision to spread its roots down through the ground to find the mineral, trace elements and water, etc. There's some sense of desire there. That desire is sparked by independence. This is a jewel. We have to appreciate the nature of the living entity, this independent quality. Consequently, the jiva also has the quality of independence, but only to a very minute degree, because he is atomic. It is only because of this independence that the jiva is the supreme object in the material world and the lord of creation. Because of this independence, we can manipulate the material energy to our own advantage. We can make a motor car, we can make a road, we can do make an aeroplane, we can do all kinds of things. We can have running water, we can make it warm in winter with a heater, we can make it cool with a fan, we can do so many things, not in India you can't, because they just turn the power off, but basically in other parts of the world you can. So the, it's, it's only this independence that has given us control or lordship over the material energy. Without that independence we would not have this lordship, so we wouldn't basically have existence without independence. Our problem has been that we've misused the independence, that's all. So it's not the independence fault. The independence itself, by itself, is a precious jewel. And yesterday, I, or the day before, I explained clearly that we're not actually independent. We have free choice. That's all. Ultimately, we have the free choice to choose to walk Krishna's path or the Mayak path. That's actually the only choice we really have. As soon as we choose the Mayak path, we're under the stringent laws and control of the material energy. Sattva, Rajas and Tamas were completely under their control. We have no control. But I do have the independent choice to choose Krishna or Maya. At every moment of the day, every breath I breathe, practically I'm making a decision. Should I come and listen to the class? Should I just wander by the Jamuna? Should I go to Radha Damada? Should I have some breakfast? Should I sleep longer? Should I chant more? Should I read? All of these independent decisions that the jiva has creates his own uniqueness. It allows him entrance ultimately into his brilliant spiritual swarup. Without that independence, what value do we have? It's described previously that the only inherent value is this independence. So it's very powerful, so we have it now, Babaji is explaining. The independent jiva is a beloved servant of Krishna, and thus Krishna is kind and compassionate towards him. Seeing the misfortune of the jiva, as he misuses his independence and becomes attached to Maya, he chases after him, weeping and weeping. Radhe Radhe. So, seeing the misfortune of the jiva as he misuses his independence and becomes attached to Maya, he chases after him, weeping and weeping, and appears in the material world to deliver him. Sri Krishna, the ocean of compassion, his heart melting with mercy for the jiva, manifests his achintya lila in the material world. 
thinking that his appearance will enable the jiva to see his nectarian pastimes. How kind is Krishna? He comes and performs his rasalila here, just for our sake. Why else should he come here? Weeping. We, W-E-E-P-I-N-G, not whipping. Whipping is, is to whip. No, weeping, yes. Yeah, crying. Weeping and weeping, or crying and crying. His heart is melting in affection for the jiva. You know in Krishna's Kastuba money that he hangs on his neck, inside that money is the jiva. Inside that money, he carries it with him all the time. This is how much he loves the jiva. He performs pastimes with the jiva. How much he loves us. Much more than we can ever love him practically. Sometimes we have to be aware of his love for us. We're trying to inspire our attraction to him. But if we contemplate his affection for us, this can make the heart melt. Just like the cowherd boys, they've been dressed by their mothers every morning. And they're saying, quickly dress me. Krishna is dying to see me. Krishna can't wait to... They're aware, conscious entirely of Krishna's affection for them. This is most endearing when we appreciate how much, like, how much does Gurudev love us. When we see that, what hardship did he put up with just to try and inject this Krishna conscious into the stone-like cold hearts of these Western devotees? Very difficult, but he gave his life for that. So it's saying his heart melting with mercy for the jiva manifests his achintya lila in the material world, thinking that his appearance will enable the jiva to see his nectarian pastimes. However, the jiva does not understand the truth about Krishna's pastimes, even after being showered by so much mercy. So Krishna again, he then descends in Sri Navadvip in the form of Guru, Bhajan Shiksha Guru, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He personally describes the supreme process of chanting, his name, form, qualities and pastimes, and personally instructs and inspires the jivas to take to this path by practicing it himself. Baba, how can you accuse Krishna of being at fault in any way when he is so merciful? His mercy is unlimited, but our misfortune is lamentable. So we see here the mercy of the Supreme. So we never need to consider that it is Krishna's fault that I am in this world. He wants us to be liberated from this world. Now today we're going to discuss the Jiva's liberation from Maya. This is chapter 17 in Jivadharma. And this is the sixth Pramaya, I think. Sixth Pramaya, yes. We've had three about Krishna and now this is the third Pramaya about the Jiva. So the Jiva's liberation from Maya. In principle, the whole principle of this teaching, of this class today, of this discussion today on the Jiva's liberation from Maya, is principally Sadhu Sangha. Sadhu Sangha is the conclusion of all scripture. This is the only way, in fact, that the Jiva can ever be liberated from this material misconception that he's the enjoyer of this prakriti, this material energy. So, there's a discussion, or Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, in his Madhurya Kadambini, he asks the question in the first chapter, where does bhakti come from? Where is it found? Where, where is its um, origin? What is the origin of bhakti? And he says at the beginning that, it's described that Bhakti Devi is self-manifesting. Therefore, it's already in the heart. So why has it manifested in some hearts and not in others? This is his question at the beginning of Madhuri Karambini. And then he says, is it due to Sukriti or pious activities that Bhakti Devi will manifest? If I help a lot of old ladies across the road, if I am kind to my neighbors, if I follow all good charitable works in the village where I live, will this give me bhakti? Does this mean that Bhakti Devi is controlled by karma? Because this will give us good fortune. 
Bargya, but it won't give us spiritual credit necessarily. It will help. It will soften the heart because it's coming to the mode of goodness, but it won't directly give bhakti. Sometimes you can meet the most beautiful people, but they have no real attraction to directly serving God. They can serve humanity. It's called altruism. They go and collect for different charities and so on, do so much good work. But actually, is this going to bring them closer to Krishna? Ultimately not. And then, does Bhakti Devi manifest by the mercy of Krishna? Is it Krishna's mercy? If I endear myself to Krishna, somehow, will he give me mercy so that Bhakti Devi can manifest? Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur says, no. Then, then, Krishna would be considered partial or impartial to some and not to others. To some he would give bhakti and others he wouldn't. So how can this be the cause of bhakti? This is not the cause of bhakti. It's not by Krishna's mercy that you get bhakti. No. Then he proposes finally that Krishna's bhakta, if Krishna's bhakta, that person who already has bhakti flourishing in his heart, if the um, jiva comes in contact with that bhakta, only then will his great fortune begin. It's by coming in contact with the bhakta that our fortune begins. So Bhagya. We see like at the beginning of Jaiva Dharma, what was the beautiful scripture of Sanyas Tako? He's describing to Param Prem Das Babaji, Paramahamsa, how he saw that Vaishnava was dancing, weeping, and sometimes slipping in his ecstasy. And at that point, some great longing arose in that Brahma Gyan's consciousness. He was so well versed in all the Shastra. Sanyasi Thakur was not a stupid person, was not just a dull, you know, individual. He was a, he was a greatly... Huh? Paramahamsa, of Paramahamsas, in the brahma line, understanding so many aspects of knowledge, of transcendental knowledge. But this relationship had eluded him. And only when he actually saw that Vaishnava dancing and crying and weeping in Mathura that he became completely um, inspired to find out where are the Vaishnavas. Where, and he traveled everywhere in Braj. He couldn't find one Vaishnava there. Then he came to Navadweep and then in Godrum he found, he heard this Prem Das Babaji. He came to him. And then his spiritual life really began. He got direct instruction. And the first instruction he got was humility. Because when he was honoring Prem Das Babaji, Prem Das Babaji was in his meditation at that time. And as soon as Prem Das Babaji's meditation broke, he saw this sannyasi lying prostrate in front of him. And immediately he was folding his arms and saying, Oh, what, what offense have I committed? How are you lying like this in front of me? I am nothing. I am so fallen. Immediately he was showing those qualities of humility. Those qualities of humility are usually lacking when one becomes very knowledgeable. We see, you know, someone who has so much gyan, there's a, there's a, what do you call, an, an illumination to gyan. The, the mind becomes bright and one starts to think, oh yes, I am very um, special in this world. And then this quality, this necessary quality, just like when we went through the Shikshastakam, we saw from the very beginning this quality of humility. Nam nam akari bahuda nija sharva shaktis. Um, etadrishi tava kripan bhagavan maipi turdaivam idrisham ihajani nanurag. This dudarivam, this so wretched feeling, Mahaprabhu is showing this. So, this is one of the first qualities that actually manifests to appreciate. Because in that humility, you are ready to discount all the apparent knowledge you may have absorbed. It's not important. What is important is my attitude and way of service only. 
just my um, uh, this endearing mood, endearing myself to the Vaishnavas, this submissive mentality, Sharnagat mood. So <clears throat> this process of liberation from Maya is described with this is the first quality. Now I want to read the seventh shloka of Das Mula. So it's describing this in a nutshell. When in the course of wandering amongst the higher and lower species in the material world, a jiva is able to behold a Vaishnava absorbed in the flowing ras of Sri Hari Bhakti, Ruchi arises in his heart for following the Vaishnava way of life. So this is the conclusion of Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur also in Madhurya Kadambini. He's saying that this place only is the um, way to get that water to water the seed that is already present in the heart. Nitya siddhyasya bhavasya prakritam hijisadite. The seed is already there. Don't think someone is going to give you bhakti. It's already in the heart, but it's going to self manifest by the water of sadhu sangha, by the water of that person who already has bhakti. This is the process. This truth has to be understood. Then the bhakti lata, that creeper, will manifest very strongly in the heart of that jiva and grow on the pillar, on the column of humility. So by chanting Sri Krishna Divya Nam, he gradually becomes free from his conditioning. Step by step, he then gains his intrinsic chinmoy sarup, his transcendental form, and becomes qualified to taste the pure and spiritual rasa of direct service to Krishna. So it's this following the Vaishnava, which is the only method to get out of this material situation we're in. <clears throat> now, it's described that how to recognize this sadhu. Or first of all, we should say, what is a sadhu? <laughs> So it's described the definition of a sadhu, sagnoti, satyati, cha krishna prem iti sadhu. This verse describes a sadhu. It's one who knows the sadhya, the goal, and sadhan, the process, and therefore can, gu can guide others to performing sadhan to attain the sadhya of krishna prem. He is a sadhu. Understand, there is sadhan. There is the sadhya. There is the sadhak who is practicing the path. And there is sad guru. This word sad means perfect. There is the perfect path, the perfect practitioner, the perfect goal, and the perfect guru. It's all completely perfect. It cannot fail. There is no way that it can fail if the guru is Sadguru, pure guru, yes. This is um, it's not saying. I'm reading from Sloka Amritam and it's not saying where this shloka is from. How amazing. This is on page four hundred and thirty five of Sloka Amrita, the first um, page of the glories of Sadhu Sangha and there's no um, it doesn't say where this shloka is coming from so but we understand that this nature of Sadhu Sangha the association of Sadhus Sadhu Sangha we're going to understand more today is the root of Bhakti it's the very root. Sadhu Sangha and Seva. Without Seva, how can you have Sadhu Sangha? And without Sadhu Sangha, 
how can you have seva? The two are integrally linked. Sadhu Sangha and seva is the root of bhakti. So somehow we must pray and be always conscious and hopeful that that Sadhu Sangha will cr very quickly manifest for us. It's described. What is Sadhu Sangha? It's, um, what is it? Um, um, Svajatiya Snigda Ashraya. Swa means own. Svajatiya, own group. Swajatiya. It's someone who has the same tendencies or principles that you have understood is the reality. For example, the goal is Manjari Bhav. The goal is not Vaikuntha Prem. So if we have had that injection, that impression to understand that Manjari Bhav is the absolute goal, then we need to be in the company of those who understand that. So Svajatiya, own group. Swajatiya, then snigda. What does snigda mean? Affectionate. Those sadhus are affectionate to us, just like Narada Muni. When previously to his birth as Narada Muni, when he was the son of a maidservant, it's described he was serving the Bhaktivedantas and they were treating him with great affection. And he describes in the Srimad Bhagavatam, that simply by their mercy, one day he was allowed to honor their remnants of Prashad. And from that moment, his spiritual life became confirmed within his heart. So from this association, Narada Muni is describing how he got such an elevated birth in his next birth from the heart of Lord Brahma to become such a great devotee. So... Um, Narada Muni himself in Srimad Bhagavatam, right at the very beginning of Bhagavatam, just like right at the beginning of Jivadharma, it's also describing the same principle of Sadhu Sangha as being the principal ingredient to become liberated from Maya. And then we have to understand, okay, so, let's finish this verse. So, Swajatiya, Snigda, and then the third word is Ashraya. Ashraya means we consider that person more elevated. We consider them more senior. This is the mentality if we want to profit by that association. We must always be considering, oh, this person is so much more advanced in his bhakti than me. If I'm always thinking that, then I myself can make advancement. But if for a moment I'm thinking or imagining, oh, I am so much more advanced in my bhakti than this person, then how can any proper relationship transpire? We can take bhakti from the newest person, so to speak. We can see that that same seed of desire is there in that heart also. It's not just that they are an old seasoned devotee that is carrying that seed of bhakti. Every jiva, ultimately, in potential, has this bhakti. But how to recognize this? We'll describe in a second. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't say this point. This is a good point. That sukriti, or this pious credits that we make, the result of our Sukriti is that we will have an opportunity for Sadhu Sangha. This is the result of our Sukriti. So, so many pious activities through so many births will give us an opportunity for Sadhu Sangha. But whether or not we take advantage of that, again, is our independent free choice. Just for example, with our Gurudev, so many people came and so many people left. So many people decided, oh, this was not going to give them what they actually wanted, and they went to another place. They lost an opportunity, perhaps, to gain that. Perhaps right now there are so many sadhus on the planet that we are unfortunate enough not to come in contact with. Perhaps we may meet someone, and we may not immediately be impressed, but that person may be carrying the ability 
to inspire our bhakti in our hearts. So we must be cautious and always respectful. Yes, we are, su we are greedy for Sukriti. We go on Parikram, etc. We do so many activities. We worship the deity. We get up early in the morning to make them breakfast, etc. Because we want to get Sukriti. We need credits. We need brownie points, so to speak. We need this credit to actually go to the next stages. It is this Sukriti that will give us higher association. And we must be always conscious of that need in my life for higher association. If there's a moment when I start to consider I don't need any other association, I don't need higher association, then it's like your spiritual progress becomes completely checked. It's stopped at that point. Why? Because of pride again. Any smell or taint of pride is a, a material conditioning. This always from the very beginning has to be we have to try to purify this. We can't purify this ever by ourselves. It's only Guru ultimately who can purify that obstacle in our lives of pride. And this is why we need sadhu. We need this pure devotee. So <clears throat> I just began to describe the eight symptoms that um, are explained in the scripture of the liberated soul from Maya. Rajanath, he asks, what are the symptoms of those who are liberated from Maya? And Babaji answers, there are eight symptoms as follows. The liberated soul has eight qualities. He is freed from all sinful activity, as well as the addiction to sinful activities that arise because of the nescience of Maya. So any sort of addictions to doing activities that are in fact sinful, that are harmful for other living entities. I may have built an addiction in life, in conditioned circumstances, to doing something or other that is harmful to others. So this is all immediately taken away by this liberated soul. He is not subject to the miseries of old age. Actually, when I was reading through these, I could see all of these in my Gurudev completely. Even though at the very tail end of life, he showed a little symptom of old age. But not even then, really. He was always like just a little kid. I mean, always, so many times, he would just jump out, really energetically and passionately. I can remember even as... In very advanced age, I remember one time Sajjan Maharaj was trying to shield him with an umbrella at Govardhan, and Gurudev was just not in the mood for it at all and just swung round and smacked him really hard, really heavy. I mean, he's in the body of an older man and he's acting, you know, just like a youthful man would act. Very vigorous. He was always like this. This is a symptom of youth. So, not subject to miseries of old age. He always remains young and fresh and has no tendency to, to decay. If ever you massaged Gurudev at all or you see saw his skin, it was always so glossy and so golden and so soft to touch. It was just like a youth's skin. His, it was so sweet. So we see this in his body physically. These are um, symptoms that we can see, perceive with our eyes. He never comes to an end or dies. Just like Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, what it was almost 40 years since he left this world. He's so alive. If you go to his temple in Iskon, I went just uh, a few months ago, maybe six, eight months ago, and I walked in at about eight o'clock in the morning, and the temple room was packed with mostly Western devotees, and they'd had it cordoned off, so no visitors could go in there, but because they saw I was a sannyasi, they allowed me in. And they were all listening in pin drop silence to a lecture of Srila Prabhupada. It was like the mood of Srila Prabhupada was so strong. Prabhupada was sitting in his murti form on the Vyasasana and everyone was gazing at him. Their nishta in their guru 
perhaps they didn't understand everything, all the instructions and so on, but nevertheless, their essential nishta in that sadhu and the way they had maintained his um, heartbeat, you can say, or understanding how alive he was, it was so obvious, he was so alive. Yes, they had the microphone <laughs> in the murti, and his voice was booming around the temple. And everyone was listening. There was not a sound. And I could see all the eyes of all the people. There were, must have been about 200 Western devotees there. And they were all just intently gazing at Srila Prabhupada. So how can we think for a single solitary second that Sadguru can ever leave this world? You can even see at the time of his samadhi how even if his body is kept for three or four days before it's actually put in salt under the ground, it's completely like rubber the whole time. If you've seen that film, um, what's it called? My Final Lesson, I think. His body is like rubber, but you see the conditioned souls, when they leave this world after eight or nine hours, their body rigor mortis sets in. One very proud individual thought that he would give instructions at the time of his death for his samadhi. And he died very unfortunately in some accident. And he'd given instructions for him to be placed in samadhi. But his body was like stiff. They had to crack the bones to make him sit. So it's obviously that he wasn't actually, he didn't have that siddha, that perfection, to maintain the nature of the, that, that um, floppiness, that rubber-like um, quality of the body. So they never decay. He never comes to an end or dies. He is never morose. But we used to see Gurudev right at the end. He would lean on his hand and sometimes he would look pensive. We have pictures. He would look like pensive. And, uh, but never, ever morose. Actually, Gurudev said one time, because so many Westerners are so mental, so much of the time. And he said one time in Mathura, I remember, I think he was saying even to Shamala maybe it was, he said, you know, I have never been mental in my life. <laughs> I don't even know what it is that you are going through. You know, this like moroseness. He, the, the guru will never. Why should he be morose? He's just away from Krishna for a little while, doing his savor here, and then he'll be back. He has no sensual desires. I saw Gurudev practically take his, you know, Dodi off almost in front of some ladies one time. He was trying to get out to go to his bathroom and these ladies just wouldn't go and he was just starting to undress himself. And you could see he was just completely like detached entirely from his body. In all ways, completely, utterly detached from his body. This is a symptom of one who is liberated from this material world. He has no connection whatsoever with the sexuality of this world at all. He has a natural inclination towards serving Krishna and no other desires. Some, we would be with Gurudev for so many hours in days and days and days and he would never be doing anything except Krishna Seva. If he wasn't writing, he was reading. If he wasn't reading, he was chanting. If he wasn't chanting, he was speaking to somebody about Krishna. If he wasn't doing that, he was considering some Seva, some temple building, some publication, something. There was never ever a time from early morning until late night constantly immersed in his savor. There was never a time when he felt, you never felt like Gurudev wants some downtime or some chill time. Never. Unheard of. Never. He was always, actually when we traveled with Gurudev, it was like a 365 day a year festival. Every single day in any sort of place, even if there was just a few of us, it would be like a festival of activities of service to Krishna in every sense. So Gurudev, every moment is service. This is the liberated soul from Maya. And all of his desires are realized. The association of such a person should be earnestly sought after. So these are the symptoms of a Mahabhagavat or a liberated soul from Maya. And this is the only path that will take us away from Maya. So Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sharava Shastra, Khoi. 
Lava Matra Sadhu Sangha, Sharava City, Koi, Hoi. That the verdict of all revealed scriptures is that through even a moment's association with the Sadhu, a pure devotee can attain unlimitedly complete spiritual perfection. This Sadhu Sangha is so important. It's the very heart. There's another very beautiful verse from the third canto. Satam prasangam mamavira sambido bhavanti hritkana rasanai gata taj josad of sat apavargo martmane shraddha rati bhakti anukramishyati. And Gurudev is explaining this progression of shraddha, rati, and bhakti. How shraddha, this first ingredient on the path of bhakti, this first um, ray of sun that can begin to ignite the seed of bhakti. <coughs> and then from Shraddha will come um, Guru Padashraya. He will find Guru through Sakriti. Previous pious activities will give him an opportunity to take shelter of Guru. And then will come Bhajana Kriya, practicing this path of devotion. And then Anishtita Bhakti, Unsteady bhakti will manifest, and then nishtita bhakti, then steady bhakti, and then some ruchi, taste will come, then asakti, and then bhav, and then prem. And then we will be examining the prem of Hanumanji, for example. What was the degree of his prem? Then higher than that, what was the degree of the Pandava's prem? Then what was the degree of Uddhava's prem? Then what is the degree of the Brijabasi's prem? Then what is the degree of Madhu Mangal Sridam Subal's Prem? Then what is the degree of Nanda Baba's Prem? And then Yashodama's Prem? And then Chandravali's Prem? Then Lalita Vishaka Radha? So this is the progression, the complete progression from Shraddha to Sri Radha. All of this progression is described in minute detail through the scripture for the benefit of the sadhak making... Um, attempting to climb out of this mayic mentality, this mayic conception. And it's all fueled and powered and kept in line by sadhu, by pure sadhu. That pure sadhu is absolutely essential. We, as devotees of Gurudev, even though Gurudev has left so recently, we are still so filled with the various truths that he's given us. Nevertheless, we are still hungry to hear about to have shelter of that sadhu who has imbibed the qualities that he has described. We're always hungry. The devotees are always asking the question, do you know any great sadhu? Is there any great sadhu that you have heard of? One devotee will hear this particular devotee and will begin talking his glories and so on like that. And we will always be seeking, where is that sadhu who's going to carry me further? Without sadhu sangha, our progress is completely checked. Because what will happen is we will start to believe, oh, I am the sadhu. I am that one who will give all the instruction. I don't need so much instruction myself. And then this quality of pride will come in again. And then everything will become tainted with a conditioning, a material conditioning, as soon as that happens. So this sadhu sangha is the principal description throughout this 17th chapter of the jiva's liberation from maya. This is the cause. Bhaktivinoda Thakur is giving so many examples through here, beautiful verses. He says, just as a jewel or crystal reflects the color of the object with which it is in contact, so a person develops qualities according to the company he keeps. Therefore, by keeping association with Shuddha Bhaktas, one can become a Shuddha Bhakta. Thus, the association of Shuddha Bhaktas is the root cause of all good fortune. This Subhagya, this Subhagya is our good fortune. Because it's not only understanding through the intellect or academically the path out of this Mayak concept. Like the Jnani, for example, he will study so much. He will be in the belief that by my prowess in absorbing these scriptures, I will be able to crash the gates of heaven. But what is the um, 
equation, you can say. What is the ele what is the essence of that crashing the gates of heaven? It is in relationship. That relationship with Sri Krishna, Sri Radha. How can I understand that eternal, loving relationship without seeing directly that sadhu who already has that relationship? I will not understand it. It's achintya. It is transcendental. We said the other day. How can the materially conditioned mind understand transcendence? Even though he is essentially transcendental by nature. We are transcendental. We are pure spirit. This is our very nature. But we can never realize that until the pure spirit comes and ignites that understanding. It cannot be any other way. I gave the example of fire in wood. All wood, this table, has fire. The element is in there. Originally this wood was a tree. It absorbed the sunlight. It absorbed the fire from the sun. The element fire is there. But this piece of wood will sit here for a million years unless another piece of fire touches it. So understand the nature of bhakti is inherently within us. But it can never be manifest without the, the association of one who has bhakti. It cannot be. There's no way it can be. Many people have a very difficult time prior to coming into the associated devotees accepting this fact. Because of the material quality of pride, I'll do it my way. My way or the highway. We want to do like this. This is what the materialist... Understand what does material conditioning mean? It means pride. This is what material conditioning means. Pride in everything. Pride in my family, pride in my body, pride in my you know, car, pride in my shoes, pride in my nose, pride in my hair, pride in anything. The materialist will find something to be proud of. And this is the opposite to the devotee. The devotee is looking to reduce all of that or purify himself of all of that misconception of his own self-importance. As himself being the center of the universe. From a child we were trained to be like the center of the universe. Study hard in school so you will be a great man in the world. So everyone will be impressed by what you can do in the world and so on. All this trying to impress, trying to show off, trying to make an exhibition of your little tiny potency in the world. This is what material education is all about. You can be at the top of the pile. Yes, everyone will glorify you. Oh my God, what happened to Krishna? I'm being glorified, but what happened to Krishna? Way, way on the back burner. So understand this. What is the meaning of conditioned life? And what is this pride that will hinder us from taking sadhu sangha? Because what is taking sadhu sangha? So you meet a sadhu. What is that? Dadati pradignati guyam. Achyati prakyati. What's that? Bhunte. Uh, chaiva. I'm waiting for you. Bhunte chaiva. Uh, sadvidim. I have to look it up. Yes. Aiva. Sadvidim. Priti Lakshanam. Sadvidi Priti Lakshanam. These six symptoms of association. Because we hear Sadhu Sangha. Sangha means I must associate. So what is this association? It's sharing one's guyam, one's confidential heart with another that you trust. So there is a trust there between you. You will share your realizations with one or two or three. Like that is a confidential thing. And then sharing prashadam. Giving and receiving of prashadam. This is what we do every day here. Someone will cook and distribute and we will take that prashadam. This is a, this is a, this is, means association. These activities are what association is about. And then giving and accepting gifts. Sometimes it's a lot easier to give gifts than actually receive them. Sometimes it's not so easy when someone is offering you something. As a sannyasi, people offer you many gifts and it sometimes becomes very difficult. Some, in some countries, they're filled with so much aishwarya 
and they just keep on and on and on and it becomes very embarrassing actually you just have to keep on you have to reciprocate with them more that's what it makes you do so this giving and receiving of gifts so these six symptoms sad vidim priti lakshman priti this um, love so th this this is what association means so in an environment like we have here in Gopinath Bhavan, the devotees should be very conscious of what is our Sangha. We are acting out our daily activities in this environment as devotees. So as devotees we should be looking to inspire each other with these qualities of what is real association. Somehow, like every single day practically, Sajan Maharaj comes into my room with half a thick shake for me. Very generous hearted and gives me that. And Sarada, she's making cakes, going everywhere, giving so much, you know, things like this is actually the activities of devotees. This is endearing each other. To, it's, it's building trust. It's, it's giving trust amongst our group, so to speak. So this is very empowering for our progress in bhakti. <clears throat> the association of materialists is the cause of bondage in the material world. So the contrary, if we associate with the materialist, if you think, oh yes, I have Krishna strongly enough in my heart, I can just go in and now enjoy the material world and start. Understand what is association. If I go and associate with the materialist, it means I'm sharing my inner confidential heart with a materialist. He could easily misunderstand that or take advantage of it or worse than that influence my mind away from devotion very easily why on earth are you walking around a hill that's 17 miles long and getting your feet sore you know why are you doing something some activity like that why are you walking around this Vrindavan Parikram barefoot I mean what's the matter with you why are you trying to hurt your feet like that they can convince you of other things you know I can remember one time I damaged my knee quite badly and I went for a Govardhan Parikrama and I was thinking of my mother and I was thinking she must think I'm totally crazy. I've probably broken a cartilage or something and I'm trying to walk around this huge mountain of Govardhan and probably some really heavy damage in my knee. Anyway, it was at night in summertime. It became very painful, 2 o'clock in the morning. It was so painful I just sat down and couldn't even walk. And then I had no choice, nothing left to do except to keep going. There was no rickshaw, no transport at all. Two, three o'clock in the morning at Govrana. So I kept walking. And by the time I got to Radhakund, I honestly couldn't remember which knee it was that was paining me. Somehow or other, the potency of that dharm of Govrana himself was able to somehow or other, you know, create a miracle for me. I mean, the devotee has this kind of faith. How can a materialist ever understand that? They cannot understand what is beyond material calculation. They cannot understand that. So don't associate with those type of people because they will challenge our faith. Only when our faith is very strong can we go out and deal with people of that nature. But generally, we should make our faith strong. So association of materialists is the cause of bondage to the material world because pride will come. I can remember sometimes when we lived in Vrindavan for many years, you sometimes get very, uh, it can get difficult, just to put it mildly, in the heat of summer or in the freezing of winter, and you can get a little despondent at times. So we used to say to each other, oh, just go up to Iskon and they'll puff your false ego up very bigly and then come back again. And it used to be a fact. We'd go there and uh, somehow or other, and uh, no detriment to Iskon, I'm not saying like that. But there was just more of an enjoying mood there at the time. Gurudev was very strict with us. And the false ego again would come up and again we would think, yes, now I'm satisfied. But again it would have to go down to those darker depths of contemplation, which aren't always necessarily sweet initially. You sometimes have to dive through a very murky channel to actually reach some of these jewels that are there buried in the hearts even though one may not know that this is so. Similarly, association with saintly people, even if it happens by chance or unknowingly, 
is called Nisanga, this Sadhu Sangha, this pure Sangha. Then there's another beautiful verse that Prahlad Maharaj is saying in the Srimad Bhagavatam that the lotus feet of Urukram, who is glorified for his uncommon activities, this Naishamatis Tavad Urukraman Griham, Sprisyati Anarta Pagamo Yad Arta, Mahishyasham Pado Rajo Bishekam, Niskinchanam No Riniti Yavat. That the lotus feet of Urukram, who is glorified for his uncommon activities, destroys all anartas in the heart. However, those who are very materialistic cannot be attached to his lotus feet until they smear their bodies with the dust from the lotus feet of a Vaishnava who is completely freed from material attachments. This is the process. All of these verses, it's just about Sadhusanga, I said at the beginning. The whole path out of this material entanglement is only Sadhusanga. And We've described who is the sadhu with those eight symptoms. We've described that the nature of bhakti is dependent on the sadhak to inspire the heart to develop that bhakti which is already dormant and inherent within it. It is within. It's unlike the Babaji philosophy, for example. They say, oh, we will give you that seed of your swarup. But we understand in our Siddhanta that that seed, that Swarup, is already there. It just has to be opened out and understood. We have to dive down and find it by the power of Sadhu Sangha. Another verse it's saying here, One is purified by the holy places where rivers such as the Ganga flow and by the stone and clay deities of Devatas only after rendering them rev reverential service over a long period of time. However, when one has darshan of a Shuddha Bhakta, he is purified immediately. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati used to say, Thakur used to say, don't think that living in Braj or traveling around on Parikrama is some sort of geographical exercise or geographical exploration. It's about associating with the sadhu. This is what it means to live in Vrindavan properly. If you live in Vrindavan, but not under guidance, not in Anugatya, not carefully under guidance, we are all under guidance of Srila Gurudev. This is how I personally feel at the moment. He planted so many instructions to us. He implanted enough instructions, I feel, for some years, some time. Nevertheless, we're still hopeful that that realized sadhu will walk amongst us. And by his activities, we will again be inspired to more diligently practice our sadhan. Without the practice of the sadhan under guidance, because if it's not under guidance, what will happen again? This material consciousness, which is pride. I can remember living in Vrindavan before I met Gurudev. I did so many things like this Dandavat Prikrama of Govardhan and standing in uh, Radha Kund up to my waist, chanting 108 times this Radha Kripakataksha and chanting so many rounds trying, thinking it was my own effort that was going to crash the gates of heaven and no success at all. And then coming in contact with Srila Gurudev immediately made all that so insignificant because that was just leading to pride. Pride in my own strength, etc. The worst thing. Sometimes I can remember even another example. There was a devotee in Australia. He was the accountant. He was always quite cranky, but he'd never ever come to Mangalati. And then one time he showed up for Mangalati. And then he came the next day for Mangalati. And then he came three days in a row and he became so obnoxious. None of us could bear him anymore. We said, please Prabhu, don't come to Mangalati anymore. We could see what was happening. All of a sudden he thought, oh now I fulfill the perfection of life. I'm coming to Mangalati every day. Yes, I'm a real devotee. Yes, now I can tell everybody what to do and this and that and the other. You know, it can be like this. Sometimes people, they chant so many rounds simply so to impress someone or they attend so much program simply to make a show. What is that unless the, the heart is actually rejoicing in the activity, then how is bhakti going to be moving along? It's a very fine line where all have difficulties in these areas, you know because we want to endear ourselves to each other, so we want to be 
walking the at least external path of a devotee, but what is happening inside? What is actually the condition of my heart sincerely? So Sadhguru can perceive that. Sadhguru can see that and he can encourage what he sees is beneficial and discourage what he sees is not going to help our bhakti. It's not so easy, it's not so clear. I can remember before I met Gurudev, I thought so many things were bhakti, were going to give me this bhakti. No, I was wrong. Yes, so some Sukriti may have come. Definitely Sukriti. We want Sukriti, it's true. We want Sukriti, but nevertheless know the limitation of Sukriti. Sukriti is not the same as Bhakti. You can have material Sukriti and you can have spiritual Sukriti. Material Sukriti will give you material benefits and spiritual Sukriti will give you that, spiritual benefits. They're quite different. So, we need the guidance. It's such a fine line. It's like, for example, if you're aiming for a star and you're one millionth of a degree off, by the time you reach that location, you're going to be millions of miles away from the star. We have to be spot on. The focus has to be really clear because the mind is wicked. It constantly wants to take a bit of pleasure, a bit of pleasure in proprietorship. Oh, this is my room. I own this room. I paid for this room. This is my part of Sri Vrindavan Dham. No one can ever take it away from me. You don't, you know, what illusion is this? What unfortunate mentality is that, that I'm becoming attached to that? And family also the same. This is my family, etc. So, all of these considerations, we need Sadhu Sangha. That Sadhu Sangha, that personality, is not envious at all. He loves us. Just like when Gurudev would step down from the podium and walk through, we would hanker for his glance because we knew it was filled with so much affection for us. He would look at our souls. He didn't want anything from us. This is the association we crave. In the material conception, even amongst devotees, there's often some ulterior motive there. Somebody wants something from you. Even amongst family members, they want some glorification. Oh, we want you to think that I am good. So these considerations are there. This pratishta is very prominent. And only the devotee, the pure devotee, can really purify this. So in this chapter, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he goes into discussing anartas. And we've discussed at many different times anartas, so I won't discuss that now. He also discusses the rarity of coming out of this material world. Perhaps it doesn't seem as rare as it really is to us, constantly living here in Vrindavan surrounded by people who are practicing a spiritual or devotional path. But when you're living in Delhi, or you're living in Aligarh, or you're living in some other faraway place, or London, or New York, or Rome, or Paris, or somewhere, the numbers of people who actually chant Hare Krishna, who are even following any sort of real spiritual path, is so minimal. So there's a beautiful verse here that Bhaktivinoda Thakur is giving. He's saying, O oh Lord, there are as many jivas in this material world as there are grains of sand. Only a few of these are human beings, amongst whom only a few direct their efforts in search of a higher goal. Of those who are endeavoring for a higher goal, only a few rare individuals seek liberation from this world, and out of thousands of such people, hardly one is actually able to achieve siddha, yogic perfection, mukti, liberation. Amongst millions of perfected yogis and liberated souls, it is difficult to find a single peaceful, great soul who is fully dedicated to savor of Sri Narayan. Therefore, Narayan's bhaktas are very rare. Even more rare is Gopal's bhaktas. Even more rare is Chandravali's. Even more rare is Sri Radha's. So it goes rarer and rarer and rarer. To find that sadhu 
who can take us across these paths. There are three types of liberated jivas. There's the jiva who is liberated from all material sufferings in this world. And there is the jiva like the jnani who is liberated or the mayavad into the brahman. And then there is that jiva who is actually liberated in his seva to Krishna. The first two are not complete liberation. They're not fully liberated because they've only come to a certain stage. But that person who has attained his pure spiritual form, who understands his pure spiritual identity, really that is the highest potential that the jiva can reach, to know our swarup. If we contemplate our swarup often, we should often think, what is my nature in the spiritual world? Don't be afraid of this. Don't think, oh, that is so high, I won't go there, I'll just concentrate on my anartas. This is not the path. This is not the path at all. Even Shukadeva Goswami, when he writes at the very end of that Rasa Panchadiya section in the Bhagavatam, he says, Vikridi tam brajavadubi itam cha vishnu, shradan vito nushunyat arta varanyam ya, bhaktim param bhagavati prati labhya karmam hridrogama savapinoti acharena dira that first the process is to hear to hear about the pastimes this vikriditam the pastimes of Sri Radha and Krishna with great faith, faith from those sadhus to hear and then varenyed to explain those pastimes oneself and then smaranam will come this is the process shravanam, kirtanam, smaranam this is the process of bhakti first we hear then we personally explain. And by explaining regularly or just talking to your friend about the pastimes, about the philosophy, then you will be able to remember those pastimes. And then only bhaktim param bhagavati labhya. Then only this bhakti will manifest after that. And then finally the third stage of this verse is that this hridrogam will clear this disease of the heart krid is the heart rogam disease karma this lust in the heart then it will be purified you don't purify the lust first and then think now I'm qualified to hear about Radha and Krishna first you hear about the divine pastimes and sweetness of Radha and Krishna's leelas this melts the heart and then Bhakti Devi will manifest and then this disease of lust will go from the heart this is the process this is the path that all the Acharyas have actually proclaimed. Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, Srila Krishnas Kaviraj, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Jiva Goswami, etc. They've all described like this. It's not that first you try and deal with your shortcomings or your anartas, etc. This will again develop pride. If you start to make some headway in your own um, shortcomings and you start to feel, yes, now I'm much more sense control than I ever used to be, what will happen straight away? <laughs> this insidious breeze kind of thing of pride again will come in. And as soon as that's there, that's a huge obstruction to actually serving Sri Radha. Who has the most humility in existence is Sri Radha. She has the most humility. She controls Krishna, modern Mohan Mohini. And yet she has the most humility because of that. She's the most endearing. It's like in Indian culture. You see that the woman generally is, she always takes the humble position in the traditional Indian family. Maybe it's changed a little now, I don't know. But I've seen most families, the woman, she accepts that humble position. And the man, he feels very much important in the household. But it's always the woman who actually controls everything. She's the one with the keys. She's the one normally who makes the main decisions because she's controlled them all by her quality of humility. It's the quality of humility that is so endearing and so controlling. So this quality of humility will endear Guru. Completely. Rajo B. Sama Sankhyata.
Is it in the Shloka Amrita book? Just in Javidami, yeah. Bhaktivinoda Thakur has so many beautiful verses. So again and again in this chapter, Bhaktivinoda Thakur is emphasizing that only service to those pure devotees is going to give us an opportunity for developing our bhakti. He's saying here in another verse, Tatana te madhava tvyaktva kvachid is the first line on page 414. O Madhava, your dear most bhaktas who have true love for your lotus feet are not like those proud jnanis, for they never fall down from the path of devotional service. How can you fall down once you've had an experience of Krishna's sweetness? Once you've really experienced his sweetness? Once you've put any unmotivated or uncontaminating um, thought aside? and you've just seen the beauty of Takoji or understood the beauty of his dham or seen through the eyes of Shastra, even for a moment, the sweetness and profound beauty of the Lord, how can you ever again fall down from that place? Actually, this is even beyond Bhav. Bhaktivinoda Thakur is saying in this chapter also that even up to the stage of Bhav there is a slight material contamination. It's only when we get to this Siddha, this place of Prem, that actually there's no material contamination at all. The example is of Jad Bharat. He was in the stage of Bhav and yet still he became attracted to the deer and he broke his worship to Sri Krishna. Since you protect them, they move about fearlessly. This is the condition of the bhakta. Krishna is completely protecting us, stepping on the very heads of those who obstruct our path. In this sannyas ashram or any traveling preacher will have experienced, this is an actual living reality. That Krishna just evaporates so many probable obstacles that may come in the path of that traveling person who's trying just to distribute Krishna's mission, Mahaprabhu's mission. So many times he'll just make, turn what could have been a very negative, volatile situation into something that is beneficial for Mahaprabhu's mission. So many times, just like now the world is in a great crisis. There's great economic stress all over the planet. You know, some countries are even practically folding their whole economic structure. It is in a very extreme condition right now. And this is the perfect place for the devotees to go and speak about the positive solution in this type of environment. I'm sure that because this Kali Yuga is so tough, that this toughness is going to create such an opportunity for people to go and speak about the positive solution to people. They'll be so fried, they'll be so crazy about how to be happy. They'll be so much denied what they want in life and then to direct them to an inner contemplation, the path of self-realization, individually, not collectively. It's not that everyone's ever going to do everything, but individually, one by one, the individual starts to take more seriously this path of self-realization. This is the answer. This is the solution for everything. If those individuals having a difficult time, it's so nice to have the voice roll around in this, but when it's, when it's the wrong one, <laughs> it makes a disturbance. No. They can't understand. And they're very important. And that's more important than anything. And we're just wasting our time sitting here in front of a microphone in front of the deities. <laughs> I know. It's no problem. I'm not disturbed by it. I'm not disturbed, Tunga Vidya. It's no problem for me. No, no. I'm laughing. <laughs> so this state of the condition of the planet is a celebration for the devotees. Because now perhaps in the next three or four or five years when things get really, really more and more extreme 
in the material situation, it's the perfect environment for the devotee to go and strongly demonstrate by his own character, not just try and tell people what the truth is, but show people. This is an anarchistic society, anarchistic world we live in. No one wants to listen to you, but they'll, they'll see how you behave. How can you demonstrate sweetness and affection? Can you, are, are you really meaning what you say? Or are you just roting out words from some religious book? Are you just like bashing a Bible or something like this? Or are you walking your talk? Can you demonstrate what is actual affection? Have we understood that like Srila Gurudev would? He would demonstrate in every single act of his life such amazing affection. I'm trying to think of some examples. Can you think of any examples? Oh, I can remember one example when Tunga Vidya told me, I think Gopinath was driving the car and he was a little nervous and they were going quite fast and then they hit a speed bump and it just bounced the car up like this. And instead of being annoyed or irritated, four wheels came off the ground and landed. And instead of being annoyed, which might have been spontaneous by someone who was a little bit tense about traveling around the world all the time and so on, he just turned to Gopinath and said, oh, she flies as well. <laughs> I mean, just every turn of the page, from that you can see so much character. You can see this person has no stress. He's just probably got off a long flight. He's probably going on another long flight later on. Lots of people think he's a very important man. He's got lots of instructions to give, all kinds of things to think about. And yet he's so humorous in some sort of situation. This, to me, symptomizes you know, enormously the potency of that individual. So many. So many. Tell me one, Maharaj. So many, I can think. I can remember one time I went to Gurudev and I was saying, Oh, Gurudev, you spoke so beautifully. That class, I, just, I was in complete ecstasy from top to bottom about the subject matter. I think it was um, uh, when Mahaprabhu left home. And Gurudev looked just with eyes big raised and said, Oh, you are so beautiful too. Like this. And, just, just, and I remember one time Prabhupada, always joking. One time somebody was, um, he came out, he was just leaving the temple. And this young girl ran up to him and said, Oh, Prabhupada, you look so beautiful today. And Prabhupada said, straight away, don't I look beautiful every day? <laughs> just immediately, just bubbling with humor, you know. And uh, these are, you, you can't read about these things. You have to have the living Mahabhagavad to impart this mood of joy. Gurudev used to say many times, you're not even really a devotee unless you're happy. This happiness is simply the mode of goodness. If you're not actually happy, you're not really a devotee. So he would say like this. So, to remember our beloved Gurudevs and to always seek Sadhu Sangha is the path of liberation from Maya. This is the beginning of the path, the middle of the path, and the end of the path. It never ends. It's unlimited. Association of higher devotees, more advanced devotees. We are always seeking that. Learn. We must learn how to nicely associate, how to respect, how to honor everybody. Not just a few, and then being callous with those we think are junior. This is totally wrong. I have to say it into the microphone because it won't come out. Such a Maharaj is saying, one time he asked Gurudev with very pitiful mood, Oh Gurudev, can I give you something? Can I serve you in some way? Do you need something? And Gurudev replied, Yes, can you give me bhakti? I need bhakti. This how can someone on Gurudev's level say like that? But then when we understand what he said, what was he thinking? The nature of transcendental love and affection is that you, this greed, it, it's never satiated. The nature of the spiritual world in Goloka Vrindavan is that every single day Radha and Krishna are running for something more beautiful than yesterday. 
there's something more inspiring. That loving relationship has become heightened from yesterday. It's always growing. It's the dynamic. It's the nature of love itself to fully be blossoming more and more and more and more. So in our lives, if we want to be liberated, so now we know what is Vibhinam Satatva. We know how we came here. We know why we are here. We read yesterday. And now we know how to get out. These three stages, Vibhinam Satatva, Jiva controlled by Maya, and Jiva liberated from Maya. These are three Prameyas in the Das Mula. Very important. Now, tomorrow will be the relationship between that Jiva that we've discussed and Krishna. What is this Achintya Beda Abeda Tattva that Mahaprabhu reconciled? This is the eighth Prameya. So we're getting through our Das Mula, I think, quite logically or step by step trying not to go too outside of the topic. Srila Gurudev Ki Jai, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur Ki Jai, Radha Gopinath Ju Ki Jai, Sachinandana Gora Hari Ki Jai, Gaur Premanandi. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Nitai Gaura Hari Bol, Hari Bol, Hari Bol, Gaura Hari Bol. Nitai Gaura Hari Bol, Hari Bol, Hari Bol, Nitai Gaura Hari Bol. Sri Satchinanda Nagora Hari Ki Jai, Radha Gopinath Ju Ki Jai, Srila Gurudev Kui Jai, Rupa Nuga Guru Varga Ki Jai, Gopinath Bhavan Ki Jai, Sri Vrindavan Dham Ki Jai, Sri Bhaktivinoda Thakur Ki Jai, Das Mula Ki Jai, Gold Premanandi Hari Hari Bo, Vanchakalpa Turubhyascha, Kripa Sindhavivacha, Patitanam Pavani Bio Vaishnava Inamonamaha.